this episode of Nova Science Now. Kiss. You'll meet some walruses with impressive brawn and brains. Sit up. Oh, get out of town. And a sea lion who takes her schoolwork very seriously. Sea lions can pass tests that are very difficult for many other species to pass, including humans. So, are these just fancy circus tricks? Oh. Or does this gift for gab? Not. And ability to reason demonstrate that animals are smarter than we think. And did you ever wonder what makes some people picky eaters? According to my mother, I was never one of them. He ate everything that was put in front of him. And I still do. But was it because my mother was strict? There was no question about being picky. I didn't even know what the word meant. Or could it be, food tastes better to me because it's in my genes. We ultimately were able to pinpoint the actual gene that causes this. And in our profile, you'll meet a doctor whose taste for science began when she performed surgery on the family answering machine. I took it apart and laid all the pieces on the table and fixed it. There were some parts left over, but it was working anyway, so I called it a day. Today, she's trying to revolutionize transplant surgery, and she's already had a major breakthrough in the race to build the first ever artificial liver. The moment that I looked in the microscope and saw that this had actually come to fruition was amazing. All that and more on this episode of Nova Science Now. Hello, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your host for Nova Science Now. Can you imagine sitting down for a meal and getting served something that you know will taste so bitter, so vile, but it's really good for you and you have no choice but to eat it? Thank you. For some people out there, this is just what it's like to eat foods that most others find delicious. Why do people have such different reactions to the same thing? Well, as I found out, the answer may just lie in their genes. Ugh. Nasty. Some kids love to eat. They'll eat almost anything. But others just hate the foods that are best for them. I like that stuff. Some kids are picky eaters. According to my mom, I was never one of them. Ever since he was a little toddler, he ate everything that was put in front of him. And it's a good thing I did. There was no question about being picky. I didn't even know what the word meant. So why are some people picky and others not? Just like we all differ in our ability to see and to hear, people differ in their ability to taste. What makes a dish taste good to some people and terrible to others. I was determined to find out. And I couldn't think of a better way to do it than to invite biologist Bob Margolski and Stuart Firestein for a tasty meal. I love good food. Although, it's still a mystery to me how my sense of taste works. So, to set me straight, the chef and my colleagues came up with a little experiment. Much to my surprise, it involved a lot more than my tongue. Hey, wait, my food is coming. What, what are you doing? I'm over here now, Neil. Ready for this experiment? I'm ready to eat. All right, open wide, here it comes. I want you to describe now just what you're sensing in your mouth. I don't taste anything. That's because flavor really consists of several different sensory modalities. It's not just the taste in your mouth, right. but also the way the food smells in your nose, the way it looks on the plate, the way it feels in your mouth. Okay. I'm going to take the nose plug off, and okay. I want you to breathe out okay. when I do that. Okay, breathe out. Wow. Completely different. Oh, it's fruit. I get some sort of sweet spices, like I get a little bit of cinnamon, maybe a little bit of clove. So now let's have a look at what you've been eating. Jello. 
All right, so why couldn't I taste it without my nose? Why should my nose have anything to do with it at all? Well, I think evolution has seen fit to devote as much of our sensory apparatus as possible to what we eat. You are, after all, what you eat. And so were our caveman ancestors. They had to use all their senses to find the nutrients they needed to survive <laughs> in a hostile environment. And just like us, they probably loved sweets. And there's an evolutionary reason for that. The sugar in sweet foods provides a lot of energy. Sweet is very important, and most people strongly prefer sweet. This is a direct measure of the nutritive value of a food. On the other hand, we have a very different relationship with that bitter taste in many vegetables. Bitter is a warning. Bitter is a protective sense. It's a signal for something potentially poisonous. The plant puts out a toxic compound so that people won't eat it. So the bitter flavor in a plant prevents people from eating it. Our bitter taste buds honor and respect that fact in the plant. Yes. Good. <laughs> Finally, you got it. <laughs> I got it. But my colleagues still hadn't explained why people like me love eating broccoli while others think it's got a nasty, bitter flavor. Stuart and Bob assured me the answer to this taste bud mystery was on the tip of my tongue. These are taste buds, and those long, slender, leaf-like shapes are taste cells. These cells enable us to detect five basic flavors, sweet, salty, bitter, sour, and umami, the Japanese word for the savory taste in meat and cheese. On the outside of each taste cell are finger-like projections covered with hundreds of tiny taste receptors. And when those receptors bind with the foods we eat, it opens a chemical pathway into the cell that leads all the way up to the brain. That's what we call taste. So why do some people hate that bitter taste found in green plants like broccoli and Brussels sprouts? And others, like me, enjoy it. It's all because of those little taste receptors on your tongue. They're actually proteins made by your genes. You've heard of genes. They're subunits of our DNA, that long chain of four chemicals best known by their initials, A, C, G, and T. Biologists have discovered that out of the thousands of genes in our DNA, there's one that determines if we like the taste of some healthy greens or if we can't stand them. And that single gene was discovered by geneticist Dennis Drena. He found it by testing how strongly people react to the taste of PTC, a compound a lot like the chemical found naturally in vegetables like cauliflower and broccoli. While some people hate the taste of PTC, oh. others can't taste it at all. Dennis found the reason why, and it's in our genes. Lo and behold, what did we find? We ultimately were able to pinpoint the actual gene that causes this. Aha! <laughs> A gene that determines how we perceive that bitter flavor in broccoli that so many people hate. So I have this perfectly prepared salmon on this sauce of broccoli. As I chowed down on a plate of healthy greens, I wanted to know just how this gene works and why it turns some of us into broccoli eaters and others into picky eaters. Geneticist Danielle Reed and biopsychologist Julie Manella are finding answers to this question with the help of middle school students like these. So the experiment we're going to do today was actually quite fun. One, two, Three. Students rub their cheeks with a sterile swab, giving researchers easy access to a sample of their DNA. Those four letters in DNA? They're packed into 23 pairs of chromosomes. On one of those pairs is the gene they're looking for. You get one chromosome from your mom and one chromosome from your dad. So this chromosome might have a gene that's a non-taster gene. And this chromosome from your dad might also be a non-taster gene. Non-tasters don't taste the bitterness in many vegetables because they have the letters GTA in that order in a certain spot on the gene. When you get GTA from your mom and dad, those taste receptors on your tongue can't bind with the bitterness in broccoli. But instead, 
if you get the letters CCG from both your mom and dad, you can taste the bitterness in broccoli, and you're a taster. And that makes you very sensitive to bitter. Now, I bet you're wondering what would happen if you got one of each. You might think of that as being a medium bitter taster. Over time, it may be possible for medium bitter tasters to actually learn to like the bitterness in broccoli. Back in the lab, Danielle analyzes the kid's swabs. She thinks she can predict who hates the bitterness of broccoli based solely on their DNA. She then returns to the classroom so now... to share the results with the students and their parents. But first, she gives each kid some PTC to drink. As she expects, some taste absolutely nothing, while others wish that they had stayed home. Especially Reed and Jared. When they see their DNA results, it comes as no surprise. They both got the form of this gene, which makes them very sensitive to bitter. And guess what? Neither of them likes broccoli. She did come right over to me afterwards and said, see, I told you I don't like vegetables. <laughs> Maybe I'll give her some slack. <laughs> yeah, I'll have a little more empathy, I guess, <laughs> at this point. So what you're telling me is that the picky eating children are not accountable for being picky eaters. It's in their genes. It is biologically predetermined. They are innocent in this accusatory world. <laughs> <laughs> So, what are parents to do with their picky eater? Uh -huh. <laughs> Let them eat cake. Oh. <laughs> My favorite part. In the end, are we really held hostage by our genes? Oh, man, that's good. Oh. Not entirely. Remember at the beginning of my meal, when I found out just how much our senses work together to create our perception of flavor? It turns out, over time, that our sense of smell changes, and that affects our sense of taste, no matter what kind of genes we have. In a recent study, my dining companion, Stuart Firestein, found that of the thousand genes in the mouse genome used for smell, not all of them are active throughout life. Maybe the same is true for us. And so we think over our lifetime, our sense of smell changes. So that something which smelled really bad, like Brussels sprouts, for example, or spinach when we were a kid, and therefore gave us a bad feeling for the taste, now smells much better. So uh -huh. young children will avoid bitter much more than the adult, and they are more sensitive and more preferring of sweet. They have a sweet tooth. They like lots of fat, lots of sugar. What you're saying is you have biogenetic argument for why the children's menu on every single restaurant in America doesn't have vegetables in it. No green vegetables, and there's always something fried and an and a ice cream dessert at the end. Boy, that sounds good. <laughs> so next time you get frustrated with your picky eater, take a moment to relax. And remember, their genes may be influencing their food choices just as much as you are. Class, we know that some animals can learn to do all kinds of entertaining tricks. But now we're finding out 
that some creatures can learn and even reason in a way that's totally unexpected. Correspondent Zaya Tong had a close encounter with a group of animals who not only go to school, they study and they're actually acing their tests. Class! Class! Thank you. Okay, Zaya, come on in. I'm so excited. So. Okay, so this was an offer I couldn't refuse. Okay, come around this way, Zaya. Oh my god, what did I get myself into? I've flown across the country for a kiss. A kiss from a Tom. walrus. Raspberry. All 2,300 pounds of him. All done. His name is Savukok. And he and two females live here at a Six Flags amusement park in Vallejo, California. Hold it. They were found abandoned in Alaska when they were only two weeks old. So here's their food. Leah Coombs is their trainer. Do you want to grab a handful out of their... Oh. Are you ready? I think so. This is certainly a long way to come for a kiss. Wow. So this is Siku right here. One Hello, of the girls Siku. That I'm and now seeing their size, I wonder if it was such a good idea. You want to give her a kiss? Give her a kiss on her cheek. Siku, target. So lean into her so she can get to you. Target. Good girl. Kiss. Okay. Good girl. <laughs> Below a kiss. All my fears aside, these guys really know how to impress a gal. Sit up. Oh, get out of town. Get out of town. As charming and funny as these characters are. Okay. Okay. Some scientists say these clowns are challenging long-held assumptions about what makes humans different from other animals. I never thought you could be so frightened. Okay, good girl. <laughs> Give me a sound. Good. And that is what Colleen Reichmuth and Ron Schusterman study. They're trying to understand the behavior and intelligence of these marine animals and others like seals and sea lions Nipper. that all belong to a family of fin-footed mammals called pinnipeds. You guys ready? At their lab at the University of California, Santa Cruz, they and their students work to understand how these animals' brains function. And to do so, they run the lab much like a school for pinnipeds. Meet the class star, Rio, oh. a California sea lion. Hold it. Definitely entertaining, but no academic slouch either. Rio's really a remarkable animal. Open. She's had about 21 years of schooling. Hold it. Hold it for... oh. Rio has some pretty remarkable classmates too, including Sprouts, a harbor seal. Speak. <laughs> and a half-ton northern elephant seal named Bernice. There you go. Good. Down. At this would-be school, the animals spend their days taking tests. Sea lions can pass tests that are very difficult for many other species to pass, including some of the great apes and including humans. Yeah. Here's how it works. Rio, like a participant at a game show, sits in front of a wood set and is shown different characters. Some that look like numbers, some like letters. Rio has been taught that certain sounds, like crickets, go with a particular number or letter, like D. So when the buzzer sounds, she selects her answer by pointing her nose at one of the cards. If she makes the right match, she gets a fish. Rio loves getting fish rewards and memorize very quickly that particular sounds go with particular letters or numbers. For instance, the ring of a telephone goes with B. So Rio could learn by trial and error that straightforward rote memorization that if she hears the ring, then she should always choose B and she's able to make that type of association very quickly. Sea lions like Rio are perfect for this kind of testing because they're like, well, a dog with a bone. Sea lions can be very focused. They can ignore lots of other distractions and really home in. When Rio makes an error, 
You may see her kind of tense up, jump in the pool, swim around. She may bark. She'll pace around a little bit. She's a bit intense. As any student knows, rote memorization is a useful skill in taking tests for a sea lion or a human. But it isn't all that impressive when it comes to demonstrating intelligence. But today's test is. This is Jason and Jack on the right, number nine on the left. Colleen wants to see if Rio can exhibit that supremely human skill of logic. So Rio had previously learned that A, B, and C, that all letters could be grouped together. And now she learned something new, that ring goes with B. So today, Rio is presented with a new problem. She hears the familiar ring sound, but her choices are only the letter C and the number nine, not B, the answer she has been taught. Now Rio must figure out what answer will get her a fish. Very quickly, she figures out that she can substitute B with any other letter. It turns out that Rio is able to use a logic rule to solve a problem that you haven't encountered before and being able to, you know, think it through and be correct on your first exposure. Rio scores over 90% on this exam, definitely an A student. It was through experiments like this that Rio became one of the first animals to demonstrate a kind of higher order reasoning once thought limited to humans. And this kind of reasoning is also believed to be the basis for the most human of intellectual expressions, language. So how does this research relate to the evolution of human language? Uh, symbols have meaning. They stand for something else. Many experiments now suggest that different types of animals have an understanding of meaning. They can comprehend the use of symbols. You can make the analogy to the way that we use sounds to identify certain objects in our environment. For example, we use the word car to identify a physical shape that is a car. Another aspect of Reichmuth and Schusterman's research is to see if these animals can be taught to control the sounds they make, like humans do when we learn to speak. Come. That is where our one-ton walrus friends come in. Most mammals make particular sounds only in reaction to a specific situation, like a dog that growls when it's threatened. Efforts to train apes and other land-dwelling mammals to control and modify the sounds they make have largely been unsuccessful. Knock. A lot of animals obviously communicate through sound, so what's different about a walrus? What this training shows is that they have incredible control over this, so that they can learn to produce these under certain occasions and inhibit them under other occasions. Give me sound. Something else now. Certainly, language is very special. You know, people have always looked for reasons to separate animals from humans. Some people will tell you it's because humans have a soul. Yes. Some people will tell you it's because humans have language. From my experiences studying animals, I can't point to any one feature that sets humans apart from non-human animals. Oh. The distinctions are blurred. Through the rigors of higher education, Open. it seems that animals like Savuka, Rio, and Sprouts are capable of surprising intellectual feats. Oh, you deserve this one. You worked extra hard. <laughs> and that suggests that many of the skills we consider to be uniquely human just might not be.
Sometimes, if something goes terribly wrong with one of your organs, let's say your liver stops working, surgeons might be able to replace it and help you survive. But for this kind of transplant to work, you need a new liver standing by, one that somebody just donated. Internal organs like this have no shelf life, and they're hard to find. But what if we could manufacture livers so that you could just order one up if you needed it? Well, in this episode's profile, we meet a bioengineer who's trying to do just that by figuring out how to build functioning livers in the lab on demand. I don't cook at all. My husband likes to say that I'm very good at preparing things, which means like heating them up. <laughs> I don't keep my car very clean. My car is a mess. Right now it smells, smells like a dead animal. <laughs> Sangeeta Bhatia seems a lot like the rest of us. She actually is really normal. I think she's remarkably normal. I find Sangeeta is a very normal person. I'd like it to be that if you met me socially, you wouldn't necessarily know what I did until I told you. What this MIT doctor and bioengineer has done isn't exactly normal. She was a pioneer in getting liver cells to function outside the human body taking a major step toward developing an artificial liver. Her problem-solving potential became obvious at an early age when she performed surgery on the family's broken answering machine. I got out the screwdriver and took it apart and laid all the pieces on the table and tried to figure out what was broken and I found something that looked amiss and fixed it and lo and behold, the answering machine worked again. There was actually some parts left over that were supposed to belong on the inside, but it was working anyway, so I called it a day. Sangeeta's parents emigrated from India, her father an engineer, and her mother one of the first female MBAs in India. My mom was sort of ahead of her time. She was a really independent, strong woman. If I look back on it now, she arranged her life so that she could work and contribute and still be home for us when we came home from classes. So when I was in high school, I, even like now, had a very full life, so I've always had a lot of things going on. I had a lot of really hard classes. I was twirling baton. I was dancing. I think I never really thought about the fact that it was a lot of work. I just thought about how I could do all the things I wanted to do. And all these activities helped her to deal with the stresses of schoolwork. You can't worry about the exam that's the next day because you're focusing in the moment on learning this move. And I think what emerged from it was this, this probably more balanced version of me. But after arriving at MIT, the harsh reality of a highly competitive, around-the-clock work culture hit hard. I felt, in the beginning, really out of my league, like I could never possibly work enough hours in the day. And I came to the lab one Saturday night at 3 a.m. And I noticed that the lab was full of people. And I had this moment where I realized that I didn't want to be there every Saturday night at 3 in the morning. Science is a marathon. And finding ways to protect part of yourself is an important part of success in the marathon. In Sangeeta's marathon, she got a PhD in biomedical engineering from MIT and an MD from Harvard. And in the process, she applied the power of computer chip technology to tackle one of the human body's most complicated organs. I fell in love with the liver, sort of by accident. When I was a first year graduate student, my advisor, Mehmet Toner, had what seemed like this fascinating project, which was to make an artificial liver. It would be an off-the-shelf transplant that you could give a patient that didn't have to come from another dying patient. The first step toward making this artificial liver was to take liver cells from a real liver and get them to function outside the human body in the lab. The problem was, as soon as the liver cells were removed from the body, they immediately began to die. As soon as we take liver cells out of the body, put it in a laboratory environment, all bets are off. They don't function, they are not happy, and Sangeeta's problem was to tackle that. She saw that inside the body, the liver cells branched off into stripes. Since cells communicate with one another through chemical signals, this striped pattern could be crucial. The hypothesis was tissue architecture should matter, but no one had ever done the experiment to show that that was the case. 
The challenge was to get the tiny liver cells to obediently line up on a slide in the lab, exactly as they do in the human body. Combining her backgrounds in biology and engineering, Sangeeta turned to the technology used in producing the tiny patterns on computer chips. If you've ever seen a picture of a computer chip, and it has all these networks of wires that make circuits, that technology that makes those patterns works by shining light on a surface. Using the same technique, creating a chemical reaction with light to etch striped lines onto glass slides, she hoped to corral the liver cells into formation. For about a year, I tried this. It turned out for my liver cells, nothing actually worked. At one point in the process, I started to think I was losing my mind because the experiment was you take this piece of glass that's clear, and you shine light on it, and it's still clear. You dip it in a bunch of clear solutions, and you pour cells on it, and at the end, they're supposed to organize. After you do this about a thousand times and you never see organized cells, you start to think that you're insane. After laboring over her experiment for a year, one day, everything changed. The moment that I looked in the microscope and saw that this thing that I had invented in my head had actually come to fruition was amazing. With the cells lined up properly, the communication system was working. Not only were the microlivers functioning, they were now living for an unprecedented six weeks outside of the human body. It enhanced the, our understanding of liver biology significantly. She figured out that if you put liver cells on a surface in a certain specific geometric configuration, bingo, liver cells uh, start functioning. Soon, these microlivers could be used to test experimental vaccines for malaria. And Sangeeta hopes that within her lifetime, she can create a functioning artificial liver to save patients with liver failure. But to do this, she needs a lot of help. I have a ton of support. I have a babysitter at home, an assistant at work, and somebody who helps run the lab, and a husband that's supportive, and parents that are nearby. So it sort of takes a village to help me run my life. It's this team of people that gives her more time to spend with her two daughters. And my girls. And she makes certain that her daughters have the same kind of positive role models that she had growing up. And in her family, Barbie is not one of them. Barbie is uh, uh, kind of persona non grata in our house. Barbie in our house is that doll that mommy doesn't like. Barbie really represents the exaggerated figure, the I don't like math. And so when I had girls, I really didn't want Barbies in the house. I didn't want that body image. I didn't want that focus on materialism. I just didn't you know, like anything about Barbie. Instead, she gave her daughters a Marie Curie doll. The cool thing about Marie Curie is that she was, of course, the first Nobel Prize winning woman. She was also the mother of two little girls, and her older daughter went on to win the Nobel Prize herself. Oh my goodness, Whoa. that went down really Right to fast. the bottom. Which one is denser? What does denser mean? Denser I don't like think that science is necessarily a career for everyone. I want to share with them a curiosity for the way the world works, and then I think whatever they want to be, they should be. It's getting sparkly. And it's not just her own daughters that she wants to inspire. Keys to Empowering Youth was an outreach organization that I helped to start when I was in graduate school. You see these young girls come in and get so excited to put on lab coats and lab goggles and work with the equipment. And I think that it does make them think about choosing science and engineering as a career and at least shows them that they have that option. I think Singita is a wonderful role model for women, but she's a terrific role model for anybody. One of the hardest things in life is to make a clear distinction between how much time you're going to dedicate to your work and how much time you're going to dedicate to your family and your friends. And she is able to manage both of those with a sense of ease that I think is inspirational, independent of whether you're a man or a woman. Once when I was at Sangita's house, I was sitting with her at our dining room table and I said, wow, this place is lovely. I can imagine you working here. And she said, why? I don't work all the time at home. I have a life. I have my kids. 
I think that she just always reminds us that life is more than just work. It is a lot of work to be a mom, and it is a lot of work to run a lab, but I don't really think about the fact that it's a lot of work. I just try and figure out how to make them all fit together. Phase one. Phase one. Every creature on Earth does the same thing. We take in oxygen and then give out carbon dioxide with the same breath. And while we're putting out CO2, trees like this one and other plants are sucking it right up. They need it to survive. But with worldwide population growth and increased fossil fuel consumption, we're now putting out more CO2 than our trees and plants can absorb. And since CO2 is a greenhouse gas, there are fears that all this carbon dioxide is heating up our planet. For some, the solution is obvious. Correspondent Peter Standring met up with some inventors trying to design a very green machine, one that can make like a tree. In a warehouse on the outskirts of Tucson, Arizona, Professor Klaus Lackner has come up with an idea even he admits is a bit fantastic. He's attempting to compete with Mother Nature. We're trying to mimic what a tree can do, and these are the leaves of that tree. Mimic a tree? Some people would say this can't possibly be done, but then on the other hand, every tree can do it. Every tree, in fact, every leaf, is like a tiny factory taking in carbon dioxide from the air and using it to make the energy it needs to survive. In the process, it releases the oxygen that we need to live. Klaus's version of a tree also pulls carbon dioxide out of the air, not for its own survival, but to help us fight global warming. Sounds pretty incredible? Well, so is the way he came up with the idea. It all started a decade ago when his 12-year-old daughter, Claire, came to him for advice. When I started to think about this problem, I was looking for ways of doing experiments. And just about that time, uh, Claire came to me in the study at home and said she is looking for an experiment to do for her science fair. I was in middle school, and I had to do a science experiment for my science class. And so I talked to my dad about various ideas, and um, he suggested this. And I said, why don't you pull CO2 out of the atmosphere? Pull carbon dioxide out of the air? A tall order for a little girl. But as the daughter of a renowned scientist, Claire already knew about global warming. She understood that when sunlight enters the atmosphere and strikes the Earth's surface, some of it is reflected back towards space in the form of heat. Greenhouse gases like CO2, carbon dioxide, work like a chemical blanket to trap heat and keep the planet nice and warm. But the increased burning of fossil fuels was generating so much carbon dioxide that our planet's temperature appeared to be rising at an alarming rate. But how could you just pull CO2 out of the air? Hello. Claire had an innovative idea. I went to the local pet shop and bought a fish pump. Right, there you go. Thank Have a you. good day. You too. I filled the test tube with sodium hydroxide. Next, I attached the fish pump to the test tube, turned it on, and ran air through it all night. As Claire slept, her experiment was hard at work. The fish pump was forcing air containing a small percentage of CO2 into the test tube. CO2 is an acid like vinegar. Sodium hydroxide, the liquid in the test tube, is a base 
kind of like baking soda, but stronger, a lot stronger. It's made of lye, the nasty stuff that cleans out your drain. When acids and bases meet, they not only attract, but they bind to each other. It's called an acid-base reaction. So the carbon dioxide binds to the sodium hydroxide and leaves the air. Claire succeeded in capturing carbon dioxide straight from the air, won a prize at the science fair, and changed the course of her father's life. I was surprised that she pulled this off as well as she did, which made me feel that it could be easier than I thought. The first sketch I made ended up looking like a tuning fork or a gold post with Venetian blinds. A far cry from Mother Nature's design. The first reaction of most people is why take CO2 out of the air where it's more dilute than in any other place? Clearly it must be easier to get it out of a power plant. But not all of the CO2 comes out of a power plant. A lot comes from cars, trucks, and airplanes burning fuel. Once in the air, CO2 is very dilute, making the idea of capturing it sound close to impossible. If Klaus was going to make this far-out idea a reality, he was going to need some practical advice. You look at Claire's experiment, what she had is a test tube. So he went to the Wright brothers, not Orville and Wilbur, but project manager and engineer Allen and Burton another set of brothers who, like their namesakes, don't shy away from a challenge. The Wright brothers were able to look at a bird in flight, so they knew it was possible to fly. Oh, it does the fluttering of the leaf. Klaus and I will look at a tree and say, well, you know, that tree is capturing carbon dioxide out of the air. We know it can be done. You've got to figure out how to do it. Not just in the laboratory with a tiny fish pump and a test tube, but on a global scale. In 2004, they form a private company called GRT. But the transition from a child science fair project to the first synthetic tree is filled with obstacles. One in particular could stop them dead in their tracks. Their tree needs electricity to run. And whenever you produce electricity by burning oil, gas, or coal, you also produce carbon dioxide. It's called an energy penalty. If their synthetic tree produces more CO2 to run than it can capture, well, what's the point? A delicate balancing act begins. For every choice the team makes, there is a price to pay, an energy penalty. Can they somehow reduce the amount of energy they use? We needed to come up with a shape where you don't have to have an aquarium fish pump driving all the air through the system, but to have the wind just deliver the air and pass it through the collector. It all comes down to geometry. What is the size and shape of the perfect synthetic leaf, one that can remove the most CO2 from the air? To find out, they construct a wind tunnel to study how air moves around and through a variety of surfaces. The easier it is to get air through, the more CO2 we can collect. We tried an array of strings. We tried screens. We tried vertical plates of solid material that were smooth. We tried vertical plates that had a knobby surface. With each attempt, they measure the air pressure in the wind tunnel. A drop in pressure means the airflow has stopped, and that sample has failed. 19. So this is not the answer. It takes a year to find a shape that lets enough air pass through. Perfect. It turns out to be long, flat sheets. The air would move through with very little resistance. It worked well. So air can move through their man-made leaves, but how will they capture CO2? At first, they follow Claire's lead, coating the leaves with sodium hydroxide. The chemistry is sound, but it's a nasty business. It will be a much tougher job for us. Sodium hydroxide is great to prove that it can be done. But it has so many disadvantages. Sodium hydroxide is a very corrosive material. It's not a good idea to get it on your skin. It's very harmful if you were to get it in your eyes. As a practical matter, trying to build a machine that works on sodium hydroxide would force us to use very expensive materials, would drive the cost up significantly. The guys decide to abandon the idea of using sodium hydroxide when they make a startling discovery, this material. Now, exactly what this material is, the guys aren't telling. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
What is it? Do I have your attention? <laughs> we can't tell you. Turns out this is where science and commerce collide. Its true identity is proprietary. That is, until their patent comes through. The team claims that this engineered fabric attracts CO2 just like sodium hydroxide, but with none of the pitfalls. Here's how the system works. The nine-foot synthetic tree opens its doors, letting air flow through its leaves, which, thanks to their mystery material, readily absorb carbon dioxide. The leaves are then sprayed to wash the CO2 away for storage. The process does use electricity, but in the future, they hope green power will make the device even more energy efficient. Still, one big question remains. What to do with all that CO2? One option lies miles from civilization. Since 1996, a Norwegian oil company has gotten a lot of practice getting rid of CO2 by pumping it into an aquifer deep beneath the North Sea. The process is called carbon sequestration. But could the carbon leak out? If so, what effect would it have on marine life? Once you've got enough gas under there and it's leaking out, it could become a very serious problem. And how much CO2 can they put down there anyhow? I believe in the long term, underground injection will not quite have the capacity we are looking for. So I am looking at another process, which I refer to as mineral sequestration. There's a perfect example of it in New York City, on the campus of Columbia University, underneath a bronze statue of the school alma mater. She is sitting on this pedestal of serpentine rock. This serpentine has absorbed CO2, probably out of rainwater. It's known as geological weathering, and if you wait long enough, that's what will happen to all of the CO2 we make. But it takes hundreds of thousands of years for Mother Nature to pull off geological weathering, and we don't have that long to wait. So Klaus is trying to figure out a way to speed it up in the lab. As for his tree, he now has a working prototype, but many questions remain unanswered. Like, how well will it survive the elements? And who's going to pay for it? Is Klaus's tree too fantastic to be real? You could have said that about the Wright brothers and Thomas Edison. I can't sit here and tell you now that this is going to work. I can tell you now that it would be a terrible mistake not to do the research to find out. I believe that it is impossible to stop people from using the fossil fuels, so we need to develop technologies which allow us to use them without creating environmental havoc on the planet. We are, as a world, changing the climate and changing the Earth, and we need to understand how we're changing it and understand what we can do either to fix it or to control how we change it. And now for some final thoughts on coming to our senses. We're born with five senses. You know each one of them. We hear, smell, touch, see, and taste the world around us. These are the five and the only five ways we obtain information. In spite of the praise they receive, our senses are incomplete. For example, we have no built-in way to register magnetic fields or radioactivity. And we're practically blind when you consider all the forms of light we cannot see, including infrared, ultraviolet, and radio waves, even though they're all around us. And often, our five senses are just plain unreliable. Eyewitness testimony, though high evidence in the court of law, is the lowest form of evidence in the court of science. When we declare a food to be bitter or sweet, we hardly ever recognize that it's an opinion derived from our genetic profile. 
More typically, we wrongly presume these features to be intrinsic properties of what we tasted. That's why it's hard to do science equipped with only our senses. The most successful fields of research are those rich in the methods and tools of measurement that do not depend on the genes of who's doing the measuring. In this way, scientists reveal fundamental truths about the universe, allowing us to decode and even predict the operations of nature. Otherwise, if all you have are your five senses, then all you have are your opinions. And that is the cosmic perspective. And now to hear your perspective on this episode of Nova Science Now. Log on to our website and tell us what you think. You can watch any of these stories again, download additional audio and video, explore interactives, hear from experts, and if you want to get the advanced scoop on upcoming broadcasts and find out what goes on behind the scenes, sign up for the weekly e-newsletter at pbs.org. That's our show. We'll see you next time. This Nova program is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call us at 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Efforts to train apes and other land-dwelling mammals to control and modify the sounds they make have largely been unsuccessful. Knock. Good knock. Knock. Good knock. A lot of animals obviously communicate through sound, so what's different about a walrus? What this training shows is that they have incredible control over this so that they can learn to produce these under certain occasions and inhibit them under other occasions. Give me sound. Something else now. Certainly, language is very special. You know, people have always looked for reasons to separate animals from humans. Some people will tell you it's because humans have a soul. Some people will tell you it's because humans have language. From my experiences studying animals, I can't point to any one feature that sets humans apart from non-human animals. Ah. The distinctions are blurred. Through the rigors of higher education, Open. it seems that animals like Savuka, Rio, and Sprouts are capable of surprising intellectual feats. Oh, you deserve this one. You worked extra hard. <laughs> and that suggests that many of the skills we consider to be uniquely human just might not be. Fantastic. He's attempting to compete with Mother Nature. We're trying to mimic what a tree can do, and these are the leaves of that tree. Mimic a tree? Some people would say this can't possibly be done, but then on the other hand, every tree can do it. Every tree, in fact, every leaf, is like a tiny factory, taking in carbon dioxide from the air and using it to make the energy it needs to survive. In the process, it releases the oxygen that we need to live. Klaus's version of a tree also pulls carbon dioxide out of the air, not for its own survival, but to help us fight global warming. Sounds pretty incredible? Well, so is the way he came up with the idea. It all started a decade ago, when his 12-year-old daughter Claire came to him for advice. When I started to think about this problem, I was looking for ways of doing experiments. And just about that time, uh, Claire came to me in the study at home and said she is looking for an experiment to do for her science fair. I was in middle school and I had to do a science experiment for my science class and so I talked to my dad about various ideas and um, he suggested this. And I said, why don't you pull CO2 out of the atmosphere? Pull carbon dioxide out of the air? A tall order for a little girl. But as the daughter of a renowned scientist, Claire all screens 
We tried vertical plates of solid material that were smooth. We tried vertical plates that had a knobby surface. With each attempt, they measured the air pressure in the wind tunnel. A drop in pressure means the airflow has stopped, and that sample has failed. 19. So this is not the answer. It takes a year to find a shape that lets enough air pass through. Perfect. It turns out to be long, flat sheets. The air would move through with very little resistance. It worked well. So air can move through their man-made leaves, but how will they capture CO2? At first, they follow Claire's lead, coating the leaves with sodium hydroxide. The chemistry is sound, but it's a nasty business. It will be a much tougher job for us. Sodium hydroxide is great to prove that it can be done, but it has so many disadvantages. Sodium hydroxide is a very corrosive material. It's not a good idea to get it on your skin. It's very harmful if you were to get it in your eyes. As a practical matter, trying to build a machine that works on sodium hydroxide would force us to use very expensive materials, would drive the cost up significantly. The guys decide to abandon the idea of using sodium hydroxide when they make a startling discovery, this material. Now, exactly what this material is? The I fell in love with the liver, sort of by accident. When I was a first year graduate student, my advisor, Mehmet Toner, had what seemed like this fascinating project, which was to make an artificial liver. It would be an off-the-shelf transplant that you could give a patient that didn't have to come from another dying patient. The first step toward making this artificial liver was to take liver cells from a real liver and get them to function outside the human body in the lab. The problem was, as soon as the liver cells were removed from the body, they immediately began to die. As soon as we take liver cells out of the body, put it in a laboratory environment, all bets are off. They don't function, they are not happy, and Sangeeta's problem was to tackle that. She saw that inside the body, the liver cells branched off into stripes. Since cells communicate with one another through chemical signals, this striped pattern could be crucial. The hypothesis was tissue architecture should matter, but no one had ever done the experiment to show that that was the case. The challenge was to get the tiny liver cells to obediently line up on a slide in the lab, exactly as they do in the human body. Combining her backgrounds in biology and engineering, Sangeeta turned to the technology used in producing the tiny patterns on computer chips. If you've ever seen a picture of a computer chip, and it has all these networks of wires that make circuit. These young girls come in and get so excited to put on lab coats and lab goggles and work with the equipment. And I think that it does make them think about choosing science and engineering as a career and at least shows them that they have that option. I think Singita is a wonderful role model for women but she's a terrific role model for anybody. One of the hardest things in life is to make a clear distinction between how much time you're gonna to dedicate to your work and how much time you're gonna to dedicate to your family and your friends, and she is able to manage both of those with a sense of ease that I think is inspirational, independent of whether you're a man or a woman. Once when I was at Sangita's house, I was sitting with her at our dining room table and I said, wow, this place is lovely. I can imagine you working here. And she said, why? I don't work all the time at home. I have a life, I have my kids. I think that she just always reminds us that life is more than just work. It is a lot of work to be a mom and it is a lot of work to run a lab, but I don't really think about the fact that it's a lot of work. I just try and figure out how to make them all fit together. to produce these under certain occasions and inhibit them under other occasions. Give me some. Something else now. Certainly, language is very special. You know, people have always looked for reasons to separate animals from humans. Some people will tell you it's because humans have a soul. Yes. Some people will tell you it's because humans have language. From my experiences studying animals, 
I can't point to any one feature that sets humans apart from non-human animals. Ah. The distinctions are blurred. Through the rigors of higher education, Open. it seems that animals like Savuka, Rio, and Sprouts are capable of surprising intellectual feats. Oh, you deserve this one. You worked extra hard. <laughs> and that suggests that many of the skills we consider to be uniquely human just might not be. From my experiences studying animals, I can't point to any one feature that sets humans apart from non-human animals. Ah. The distinctions are blurred. Through the rigors of higher education, Open. it seems that animals like Savuka, Rio, and Sprouts are capable of surprising intellectual feats. Oh, you deserve this one. You worked extra hard. <laughs> And that suggests that many of the skills we consider to be uniquely human just might not be. And I couldn't think of a better way to do it than to invite biologist Bob Margolski and Stuart Firestein for a tasty meal. I love good food, although it's still a mystery to me how my sense of taste works. So to set me straight, the chef and my colleagues came up with a little experiment. Much to my surprise, it involved a lot more than my tongue. Hey, wait, my food is coming. What, what are you doing? I'm over here now, Neil. Ready for this experiment? I'm ready to eat. All right, open wide, here it comes. I want you to describe now just what you're sensing in your mouth. I don't taste anything. That's because flavor really consists of several different sensory modalities. It's not just the taste in your mouth, right. but also the way the food smells in your nose, the way it looks on the plate, the way it feels in your mouth. Okay. I'm gonna take the nose plug off, and okay. I want you to breathe out okay. when I do that. Okay, breathe out. Wow. Completely different. Oh, it's fruit. I get some sort of sweet spices, like I get a little bit of cinnamon, maybe a little bit of clove. So now let's have a look at what you've been eating. Jello. All right, so why couldn't I taste it without my nose? Why should my nose have anything to do with it at all? Well, I think evolution has seen fit to devote as much of our sensory apparatus as possible to what we eat. You are, after all, what you eat. And so were our caveman ancestors. That bitter flavor in broccoli that so many people hate. So I have this perfectly prepared salmon on this sauce of broccoli. As I chowed down on a plate of healthy greens, I wanted to know just how this gene works and why it turns some of us into broccoli eaters and others into picky eaters. Geneticist Danielle Reed and biopsychologist Julie Manella are finding answers to this question with the help of middle school students like these. So the experiment we're going to do today was actually quite fun. One, two, three. Students rub their cheeks with a sterile swab, giving researchers easy access to a sample of their DNA. Those four letters in DNA? They're packed into 23 pairs of chromosomes. On one of those pairs is the gene they're looking for. 
You get one chromosome from your mom and one chromosome from your dad. So this chromosome might have a gene that's a non-taster gene. And this chromosome from your dad might also be a non-taster gene. Non-tasters don't taste the bitterness in many vegetables because they have the letters GTA in that order in a certain spot on the gene. When you get GTA from your mom and dad, those taste receptors on your tongue can't bind with the bitterness in broccoli. But instead, if you get the letters CCG from both your mom and dad, <laughs> we can't tell you. Turns out this is where science and commerce collide. Its true identity is proprietary. That is, until their patent comes through. The team claims that this engineered fabric attracts CO2 just like sodium hydroxide, but with none of the pitfalls. Here's how the system works. The nine-foot synthetic tree opens its doors, letting air flow through its leaves, which, thanks to their mystery material, readily absorb carbon dioxide. The leaves are then sprayed to wash the CO2 away for storage. The process does use electricity, but in the future, they hope green power will make the device even more energy efficient. Still, one big question remains. What to do with all that CO2? One option lies miles from civilization. Since 1996, a Norwegian oil company has gotten a lot of practice getting rid of CO2 by pumping it into an aquifer deep beneath the North Sea. The process is called carbon sequestration. But could the carbon leak out? If so, what effect would it have on marine life? Once you've got enough gas under there and it's leaking out, it could become a very serious problem. And how much CO2... Why we change it? And now for some final thoughts on coming to our senses. We're born with five senses. You know each one of them. We hear, smell, touch, see, and taste the world around us. These are the five and the only five ways we obtain information. In spite of the praise they receive, our senses are incomplete. For example, we have no built-in way to register magnetic fields or radioactivity. And we're practically blind when you consider all the forms of light we cannot see, including infrared, ultraviolet, and radio waves, even though they're all around us. And often, our five senses are just plain unreliable. Eyewitness testimony, though high evidence in the court of law, is the final thoughts on coming to our senses. We're born with five senses. You know each one of them. We hear, smell, touch, see, and taste the world around us. These are the five and the only five ways we obtain information. In spite of the praise they receive, our senses are incomplete. For example, we have no built-in way to register magnetic fields or radioactivity. And we're practically blind when you consider all the forms of light we cannot see, including infrared, ultraviolet, and radio waves, even though they're all around us. And often, our five senses are just plain unreliable. Eyewitness testimony, though high evidence in the court of law, is the lowest form of evidence in the court of science. When we declare a food to be bitter or sweet, we hardly ever recognize that it's an opinion derived from our genetic profile. More typically, we wrongly presume these features to be intrinsic properties of what we tasted. That's why it's hard to do science equipped with only our senses. The most successful fields of research are those rich in the methods and tools of measurement that do not depend on the genes of who's doing the measuring. In this way, scientists reveal fundamental truths about the universe, 
allowing us to decode and even predict the operations of nature. Otherwise, it's better to me because it's in my genes. We ultimately were able to pinpoint the actual gene that causes this. And in our profile, you'll meet a doctor whose taste for science began when she performed surgery on the family answering machine. I took it apart and laid all the pieces on the table and fixed it. There were some parts left over, but it was working anyway, so I called it a day. Today, she's trying to revolutionize transplant surgery, and she's already had a major breakthrough in the race to build the first ever artificial liver. The moment that I looked in the microscope and saw that this had actually come to fruition was amazing. All that and more on this episode of Nova Science Now. Hello, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your host for Nova Science Now. Can you imagine sitting down for a meal and getting served something that you know will taste so bitter, so vile, but it's really good for you and you have no choice but to eat it? Thank you. It didn't, you know, like anything about Barbie. Instead, she gave her daughters a Marie Curie doll. The cool thing about Marie Curie is that she was, of course, the first Nobel Prize winning woman. She was also the mother of two little girls, and her older daughter went on to win the Nobel Prize herself. Oh my goodness, that went down really Right to fast. the bottom. Which one is denser? What does denser mean? I don't like think that science is necessarily a career for everyone. I want to share with them a curiosity for the way the world works, and then I think whatever they want to be, they should be. And it's not just her own daughters that she wants to inspire. Keys to Empowering Youth was an outreach organization that I helped to start when I was in graduate school. You see these young girls come in and get so excited to put on lab coats and lab goggles and work with the equipment. And I think that it does make them think about choosing science and engineering as a career and at least shows them that they have that option. I think Singita is a wonderful role model for women, but she's a terrific role model for anybody. One of the hardest things in life is to make a clear distinction between how much time you're going to dedicate to your work and how much time you're going to dedicate to your family. 